again and welcome to Man's Talk. I am Tammy Simmons Garthwaite. And I'm Carla Garrett. We haven't been here in a bit because, you know, life. Well, yeah, I was on holiday, you were on well, holiday. That's okay. and life. life happens. We just took a little time off, but man, I hit the ground running this week. Yeah, the, I'm, actually I'm, last I'm slowly week. working into it. Um, we had been, obvi- we went camping all lots from Labor Day on. We just got home on Sunday and um, we were up in, oh, I tell you, there there are so many beautiful places in New I Hampshire. Know. So we went all the way up to um, Umbagog, Umbagog Lake um, State Park, which is almost to Canada. And when I say almost to Canada, anybody who was in my car with us when we drove to the border in, of Canada, it's for, there's a sign, and then it took for, it seemed like it took forever. But what was interesting, if you're ever looking <laughs> on your Google map and you see a very jagged, thick black line yes. on your map, that's another country. Oh. <laughs> we were laughing. We're like, what's that? And I'm like, I think that's Canada. So, um, but it, the mountains. That's northern New Hampshire yeah, now, and folks. you're not going into Vermont. So the <laughs> mountains up there, we, we took a route in through, um, through an edge of Maine. It was, I, I just was like, this is insane. And Mar- my friend Marion was with us, and she's traveled, like, she's done the Rockies and stuff, and she's like, yeah, this is very similar to the Northwest when you're really in there. And it just, I, it made me real, remember that, you know, there's so many beautiful places just in New Hampshire or maybe into Maine or Vermont that, like, you don't have to really travel far to really get away. No, I mean, during COVID, I definitely had a sense of, if I was trapped in one place for the rest of my life, <laughs> which, you know, things. sounds crazy. Mm. But I'm like, this would not be a bad little country, yeah. right? Like, you got seacoast, you got mountain, you've got trees, Canada. you've got mushrooms that still grow. You know, the soil's still healthy. Oh it would God, be a good rain, place. The weather is oh. just so bizarre. So I don't know how hot it was here. It was hot. Right. I figured it was really hot. So here I am... Um, here I am traveling almost to Canada in September to go camping. So, you know, I went, oh, before looking at the weather, you'd think, well, I better bring some long pants and a sweatshirt. Yep. Okay. It was so freaking hot. Oh, my like, goodness. It was, I mean, but I, it was like, here I am camping. And it, it was, was really unbearably humid. hot. Yes. Like, it's a, it, it was an oppressive, like, the barometer dropped. Oof, we like, we uh, never use our air conditioner mm. in the camper. I, every day, every afternoon, we ran the air conditioner because there was no way... You could you could keep it cool. I enough. mean, honestly, it's it's it September. Bizarre. I actually saw my Facebook memories. Uh, it came up, yeah. and there was a photo from you know a year ago yeah. yesterday. I think it was, and I was like in a long sleeve with a jacket with know. a scarf. Yeah. And that same day, I went swimming yeah. on Lake Nemeskey. Yeah. It was so. just crazy. So we and then when we were over in Maine, it was the same thing. I mean, I was floating on lakes and rivers, and I was like, this is just so yeah. Bizarre. Your trip looked fun. Yeah, you had fun. Um, it's it's a good, we, we have a good September trip that we take every year. Yeah, I was actually up in the North Country yesterday. I went up to meet with uh, Crosby from Rogers Campground for lunch. And so, you know, we went through the pass and Murrow Lake yeah, and yeah. Echo Lake and all these just beautiful places yeah. where you're like, wow, we are really So we were fortunate. joking. We were, God, Dan, I wouldn't have noticed, but Dan said we did four four notches. We did Crawford Notch. Oh, for Konya, probably, right? No. Crawford Notch. No. Oh, I'm not going to get it now. Um, But Grafton Notch in Maine, Pinkham Notch, and Franconia Notch. Okay. All yeah. in, in our trip. So mm-hmm. it was kind of cool. Nice. Uh, so nice. I have some things to report. Okay. First of all, for everyone who was following along with the whole... <gasps> gunstock drama last year where free staters were accused of trying to take down gun stock and uh, it was in the paper there were headline newspaper articles there were news yeah clips it. it was very much made out to be it was before the election cycle and it was very much made out to be negative towards anybody who was um I don't even know if they were all free staters on the Republican they, they, side they of the were. ticket. They were. So there were there were like twelve people on this yeah. commission, of which two were uh, out uh, free staters, and one guy. I was like, st- oh, he could be, but he's yeah. kind of more a pre stater, I think. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway, uh, it was it was a lot because the reason I know is because NBC. That was one of the main issues. Right. And in fact, if you go to the NBC. Um, documentary i think there are several times it within that documentary uh that they talk about this gun stock issue so lo and behold uh last week 
a memo, August 2nd. So I guess, oh, a this month. took a while. Yeah. Well, no, I think it took a while for the news to even yeah. come out. So let's say, here are some tells. When there's something happens and there's an immediate press release, they want you to know about it. When something happens and they drop the press release at 9 o'clock on a Friday night or somehow you find out about it a month later, then they don't want you to know about it. So in my hands, I have a letter from the Attorney General uh -huh. of New Hampshire to Thomas Day, who is the general manager of Gunstock, yeah. in which they tell them, Gunstock Area Commission electioneering cease and desist order. So for those of you who are following along, there were people, so Gunstock is a county. Count, well, it's a county-owned ski resort that has yes. this uh, Gunstock Oversight Committee that had all yes. these people in it. And then this new guy, Thomas Day, came in in 2020, and people were like, we think there's fishy stuff going on. We think we should do an audit. And then they, they commissioned the audit, the Oversight Committee commissioned the audit, after which the entire management team Walked quit, up. which is... Unusual. A red flag. Well, they didn't um, like. They didn't like people looking. They didn't feel. They, didn't they took want... it as an insult that they were being audited. Turns out, in the audit, it yes. came out that they were paying uh, campaign contributions to Chris Sununu's campaign. So we have a government-owned ski resort that is now paying uh, electioneering to a sitting governor and Which is weird. at the time we were all like this seems a little fishy i mean someone should take a look at this you know how can this be public funds and it's being cut and spent in these ways so it took the attorney general a while but they do admit that yes indeed it was electioneering now as people who follow along for a long time know somehow there are different rules when you and i put something that's not accurate in, I don't know, an, a tax filing or in a grant right. application, or if we break the law, say, we don't have the grace of the attorney general to be like, yo, you broke the law, stop doing it. We don't think you had an intent to do it. So yo, just don't do it again. So you know but Gunstock you know is afforded say, that grace. And what I don't understand is, to me, it's just common sense. If you are the manager of a, an entity that's obviously funded by the government, it's not like it's confusing. It's not like you didn't know it was funded by the government. What part of you doesn't say, I don't think we can write, I don't think we can disperse money to that and, to, and all sorts of different entities. entities. You know, if Planned Parenthood went to them and said we'd like a donation, I'd be like, mm, I don't really think gun stocks, I don't think that's in the purview. And so that's what always amazes me is that people don't seem to be well, able to just follow common sense. Well, that, but then also you have to, I mean, I, 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 I take umbrage, that's a word, uh, to this entire conclusion that they come to here, because basically they do say, oh, these were political contributions. Mm -hmm. You utilize public resources in violation of X, Y, uh, yeah. you know, X, Y, and Z, RSA. Um, but we did find that you didn't have any intent to violate the law, so don't do it again. Right. But then the creative way they get around this is they, they do an investigation and they say, based on our investigation, it appears that making political contributions is a common practice with private ski resorts. But so private ski resorts is different than publicly funded ski resorts. Uh, yes, and, and, and just, I mean, to, to tie all the things together, Thomas Day, who is now the manager at Gunstock, was the previous manager at Waterville Valley. Right, but, that um, would make, but, but Waterville Valley is not publicly funded. So maybe, I mean, maybe... It goes back to my thought. Okay, so when you were at Waterville Valley, it was perfectly within the rights of Waterville Valley to make campaign contributions to Chris Sununu. Nothing, there, you, you can. But if you're running that, just because you're running a ski thing, right? when you ship from a pu private ski facility to a public ski facility, co again, common sense would say to me, 
you would know you should know better right unless you're running your public ski resort as if it's your private assets um so this was kind of interesting so then they were saying that okay but what does the gun stock enabling statute say like Mm -hmm. what what are they allowed to do are they allowed to do this right I wish I could run my life like this. There are no rules, let alone rules with specificity, relating to how money is spent at Gunstock. That okay. is in writing. Well, no, okay. Okay, so I'm so like... it's not specifically laid out in the RSA about how they can spend money. Right, but they also apparently do not have uh, any policies at Gunstock to mm-hmm. be like, how do we do it? So the question became, is it electioneering, right? Like, did these people... Uh, practice electioneering and yeah according to the legal definitions of what happened it does appear that that is what happened but then get this then they're like well but is this guy a public employee so Mm. is is the general manager of gunstock a wholly owned government ski resort right it's owned by Belknap County. Or, That's well, the, I mean, I, I presume it's funded by Belknap County, but I don't know if the Gunscock Ski Resort is a private or public entity, but it is definitely with oversight by the by the public. I, I mean, I think it is public. Okay, okay so then, they're, th- then they say, okay, uh, Law X prohibits public employees from engaging in electioneering. Right. And then the way they get around this whole thing to be like, well, we're not going to say you're in trouble, is literally just saying, well, this guy's not a public employee. But the way they do it is they say because anyone who has access to confidential information, whether an individual is a confidential employee, is whether he or she has access to confidential information, including but not limited to labor relations, negotiations, or significant personnel decisions. And then they basically go, well, according to that, this guy is... So it says, the general manager of Gunstock also has access to such information due to his or her administration of subordinate staff, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, as it pertains to the electioneering prohibit prohibition, you do not constitute a general, uh, a public employee within the meaning because you're a general manager, so you are allowed to electioneer. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know... It was just a big hot mess, and it, it, you and know, it, it goes to show that just because you read something in the um, well in the news doesn't make it so. No, but it also is you know it's sort of frustrating because the cycle is that you know you demonize people mm-hmm. and uh, you know tell a certain story that is a lie and untrue and uh, rude. And then, uh, you know, a year later, they're like, oh, oops, yeah, sorry, those guys were actually kind of right. Well, so, Speaking of demonizing people. Yes. It, it ties right into what I was, got under my arc this morning, this, I shouldn't say this morning, yesterday and today. So we have a state rep, Alessandra Murray, mm-hmm. who on her Twitter page says she is the co-chair of the New Hampshire House Progressive Caucus. She's a Democrat. Um, I believe she represents Ward 9, but don't okay. quote me on that. I think so, though. I, I oh, no, she definitely does, because I was at the State House once with Victoria Sullivan, and Victoria was trying to talk to her, and she didn't want to talk to her, and she was like, Victoria's like, I'm your constituent. So <laughs> she's the co-chair of the New Hampshire House Progressive Caucus, the clerk of the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, an at-large Democrat or a delegate for the Manchester Dems. Her pronouns are they, them, because she um, is... Non-binary. Okay. Whatever. Um, I don't understand why this particular Democrat, and I'm going to say this in general, a lot of Democrats in general really, really hate people who homeschool. They demonize them. So now she's got an idea for a piece of legislation. Okay. I think we need direct communication between the local school district, because, you know, they're perfect at everything, and students. Bring them in, and she's talking about homeschooled students. Oh, okay. And private school students. And charter, or? Well, charter is public, so yeah. uh, Bring them in for annual reviews without the parents present, 
with a school counselor so the students can speak freely. Make sure they have access to college info, driver's ed, et cetera, in those meetings. Okay, why do you presume that children who go to private school or are homeschooled don't have access to college info, driver's ed? What do you think the parents do? You know, and I started really thinking about this. Let's go back 40 years. Homeschoolers were a little quirky. If you go back 40 years, it was kind of isolation. You know, there was more isolation because there wasn't so many. The homeschooling families and the kids that I know that are homeschooled are not deprived of social activities. They have school they have friends. way better they have school. After school yeah. the, the, the description of after school activities. They participate in sports. They're fully aware of that college is coming. They <laughs> they learn to drive when they're I mean, four. Right, I'm just, right. <laughs> they're probably taking college classes in third grade. Um, but it, why not? So it made me start digging because I was like, what the heck's the problem? So then I started finding more po another tweet from her about um, she met, posted something. This is something that I, I try not to do a lot. I'm sure I do it from time to time. You know, when you post a screenshot of a tweet that you don't have context, context for, for mm -hmm. so you don't even really know who made the tweet. So some random person who may or may not have been a Republican posted something about their children don't have any rights, and even the the females when they they don't have any rights until they get married, and then the rights are transferred to them. Okay, that's some random. That's some random. I don't know anybody who thinks that women have no rights until they're married. That's just stupid. Anyway, she tweeted that and then commented about how that's how she was raised. And I was like, okay, so it sounds like you got daddy issues. You maybe should would work that out before you take it out on the public. Um. My parents homeschooled me with the best intentions, but the experience only had negative impacts on my adult life. I never want a kid to feel abandoned by the education system like I did, left without a transcript or a diploma to figure out life for myself. It's so important, especially for homeschooled high schoolers, to make sure they know how to enter society. Because, you know, homeschoolers don't know how to enter society. Um, get a job. You do know college, that you're part of society and, from the moment you're born, and by the way. It's not when you turn 18. And have the, those resources readily available to them. And this can be done without superseding, superseding a parent's right to homeschool. So, and then she muted it herself from the conversation. <laughs> Because she didn't want to hear the other thing. The good thing was the majority of people, because her solution to everything is more money for the public schools. And by offering education freedom accounts that give parents choices, we're somehow diminishing the public schools. The good thing about this thread is pretty much everyone else in it was like, you're nuts, lady. The can, public schools can, well, are, I mean. Well, but here's the thing. Let's, let's unpack some of that, right? So some... I think this is a really important thing that we need to start to understand is if something bad happened to you mm -hmm. and bad things happen to most people, yep. actually everyone's walking around with, with some, some kind, kind of, of trauma yep. or some kind of hurt or some kind of something. The way to get over that is to process it for yourself, but it doesn't mean that you have to go write a law <laughs> exactly. that right. now pertains that to protects. everyone right. to protect everyone from your, your kernel of right. whatever your right. issue is. And in fact, I would posit that the reason we're in this bloody mess we're in with society where we have over-regulated and over... Yep. I went to this right to know meeting, which maybe we'll get time to talk about, where I was, so we created an ombudsman's yes. office, and now we're going through the rules of how this office is going to work, and it's 65 pages yeah, of like minutia of, and I, I, I sat in the meeting with this, this uh, he says in the, in the rules, call him Mr., so this Mr., um, where at one stage, I just, I said to him, but what, like, let's just, pretend for a second let's just do a thought process or thought experiment where we go forget about it having to have to comply with these rules and these rules and these rules What's and the these goal? definitions and all of this which makes it this word salad that no one can actually tell what we're supposed to do like what would you do like right. why can't it just be a reasonableness standard again right yep. that's what the actual constitution says so we've become mired as a society in this this cross-checking, right, from one bill yeah. to another, but there's so many hundreds of bills that it is, it's, it's, we have codified people's trauma and we have codified 
stuff to such an extent that it is actually we are codifying insanity at this stage like it is just layer upon layer upon layer that cannot fathomably well, make sense anymore and, and like okay so you're I, i'm completely in agreement obviously um but like what you're talking about with gunstock and saying oh but not you know there's this rule but it doesn't apply to you. so there's another I don't get it in Manchester. <laughs> so if you haven't heard, um, charter schools specifically, not not like one particular public school, charter schools, all charter schools in Manchester no longer have busing. So it's been it's been suspended because the company that the school that either the superintendent or the school board or somebody in charge um, contracted with STA says they were contracted to do 25% of the routes in Manchester. And then 50% of the routes were pushed off on them and they do not have enough bus drivers. So who didn't know, who can't figure this out? I mean, these are the same group of people that would like taxing authority over us and they can't figure out how to get children from the house to the school following state law. The state law says you must bus charter school kids the same way you, because it's a public school. school. So I like my brain, it just bleeds out my ears because I, I think, oh my God, how bad is it that you can't manage this? And then I did hear Victoria um, talking on their show earlier this morning and she said, so she can go back a decade when her kids were in grade school. And she said, you know, she used to drive them to school in the morning and drop them off and they'd play on the playground and there would be some teachers hanging out and parents hanging out and the kids would run around and burn off energy before school and everything. And then they'd pick them up after school, it was all great. Then there was um, a teacher's contract that the unions were pissed off that didn't get approved. And they said to the teachers, do not work one minute extra than what your contract is. And some teachers still did, but it, they were telling them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. So Victoria said, so suddenly you went from, and prior to this, there were so many parents dropping off that they said, no, 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 just put your kids on the bus, put your kids on the bus, it'll make it smoother for the transition. So then parents put all their kids on this bus, on the bus, and then the teacher stopped going, staying after. So Victoria says, so now you've got little kids who don't know what bus to get on. And she said it was total chaos. And she goes, it really was. The impetus for it was the teachers union being pissed that they didn't get what they wanted. So they mucked up the whole system that was working well. But that is, I mean, that is also the story of big government, right? Like I was thinking about it this week with regard to immigration, right? Like everyone's up in arms, like what should we do, whatever. I'm an immigrant. America is a nation of immigrants. It is part of our story. Mm -hmm. It is part of the story of the American dream. Yep. I mean, it's aspirational. My like we here. should. My grandparents, most of my, you know, half of my grandparents weren't from the United States. Right. I mean, it is the story of America and it's supposed to be in, and, and it's, and it's a cool story, right? Like right. you could come from anywhere and make it yep. if you work hard right but then I was talking to someone and we were like when did it all go pear-shaped and where I can recall because I think it was around about the time I immigrated was there was some some person some congress critter got um caught having like an illegal nanny or something and it became this mm, huge story more. right in the same way gunstock becomes a huge story or all these things where someone's trying to do a wedge i.e actually manipulate you um it became this wedge issue where everyone was like, now all the nannies have to be legal right. and all the, but in the past, you know, people would come in and maybe they were under the table and the first generation, you know, was a gardener and maybe you're yeah. a, cl a cleaner or someone who came in once yeah. a week or whatever, but their kids would actually be supported. Yeah. And those kids would be the next generation of Americans yeah. go to law school, who go to medical yeah. school, and do all of that. And it was kind of this cycle. Yeah. And we've broken all of that. I mean, we have, I, I see it all the time because it kind of frustrates me because I do see a lot of people, Republicans, Democrats, across the board. You know, people can't distinguish between people, immigrants, illegal, people who are here illegally, and refugees. Like, they can't even compartmentalize that. Like, there's all different ways that people come to our country. Um... And I don't think we have a good system. I don't think, and this isn't a Trump thing. This is, we haven't had a good immigration policy. Since like 96, I think. Oh, easily, <laughs> if not before that. You should be able to, there should be a more streamlined, readily available process for those who are coming to this country or wanting to move to this country to be self-sufficient and work hard and move ahead. Instead, what we have is a terrible policy that makes it incredibly difficult for people to do that. 
And at the same time, we just let tens of thousands of people pour over our borders every day. So yeah, heck, it's you know, it's, it's stupid. It's all broken. Speaking of stupid, yes, on the busing thing, because that was like you were talking about, like why do we have all this convoluted right. stupid laws? Now this isn't a f- state law. This is in the city ordinance. But I found myself going, why is that even in there? Did you know that there is a city uh, school district policy, the school okay. district directive? All team members, this is sports, all team members shall travel to and from athletic contests by means of transportation provided or organized by the athletic coordinator or the city athletic director. An exception to this rule shall be the release of a student or athlete to his or her parent or guardian upon written request to the athletic coordinator who will consult with the coach. Exceptions may be made when district provided transportation is unavailable, which is the case right now. When the parents of each student given gives written per- consent and the parent driving the carpool is a licensed driver is driving a vehicle registered in the state of New Hampshire and meets the insurance choir requirements of 500,000. Wow. Co- wow. Why is it any but it, the city's <laughs> damn business how much insurance a parent has uh, on their car uh, if they're driving their child and their neighbor's child whose parents made a conscious decision to say, yes, you can go with Johnny's parents to the sporting event. I don't know if Who someone could explain school buses I don't got- have safety bells. Oh, well, and there was because a- you know, it's like, it's almost like there are certain rules for a political class, and then there are us please on the other side. I saw a picture on Facebook today, I think it was in the Ward, in one of those, in the Ward 8 group, of the Memorial High School bus, and there are like two or three kids on each seat, there are kids squatting, they are like packed in there like sardines, and I'm like, okay, that, that can't the be number safe. of buses that we need to transport the children is not rocket science in well, my Well, also, I'm like, aren't all the MTA buses empty? Can't they well, take school kids? Like, why can't, can't, school, just, why can't the just school sus- roots? Why don't we suspend something that isn't required by law <laughs> and shift them over to fill the gap? I don't know. It's all crazy. But before we run out of time, we have to remind you, it is the primary for oh, the city Tuesday, elections on Tuesday. Um, there are four candidates, June Trishiani, Will Stewart, Kevin Kavanaugh, and the only Republican, Jay Rue, running for mayor. I was so impressed with him. I heard him doing a little stump speech today. It was and- really good. You know, he's, he's on eligible. top of this issue um, about the homeless, the vagrants, making sure that, you know, people aren't in this. I mean, two dudes shot another yeah. dude and went out on PR, personal yep. reconnaissance bail the same day. Yep. And that then, doesn't seem right, um, folks. Wards 1, 5, and 11 have primaries for aldermen. Okay. Um, I w- If I lived in Ward 5, I'd be voting for Kathy Paquette. Um, I think if I was in Ward 1, I'd probably be voting for Chris, whatever his name is. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's the soccer guy. Um, and if I were, lived in Ward 11, I would be voting for Andre, Andre Rosa. Rosa. I like Andre. He's a buddy yeah. of mine. And he's just got good intentions for the he's, city. He's um, a, yeah, he's so a sweet, nice Tuesday, guy. next Tuesday, is primary day. Polls are open from 6 in the morning till 7 at night in all wards. Um, there's no excuse not Six? to get out and vote. Six, six in the morning? Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was at seven. No, that it's might six. be why I've always it's been late hours. to the polls. There's 13 <laughs> hours of opportunity to vote. So get out and vote. Even though, I mean, it's going to take you a second because yeah. unless you live in one of those three wards, you're picking amongst those. You can pick one person or maybe you can vote for two. I don't know. Follow the instructions on the ballot. It's nonpartisan primaries are so incredibly difficult to understand and people don't understand and we should do away with but if people want a fair race come out vote for jay just uh you know because it's well i mean at least give us give voters an opportunity to have a choice between a democrat and a republican in november let's just go with that um and you know you've had six years of uh democrat rule here and things definitely did not get better and one other if you had a better well you wouldn't bet a beer but if you had a better coffee right now who would it be uh june Hmm. i think it's will stewart Oh, we'll interesting. See. I don't know. We'll see. We'll know by the time we tape on Wednesday. Anyways, <laughs> they're giving us the wrap-up sign. Um, stay dry. It's miserable out there this week. And avoid the hurricane on the weekend. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.